At the beginning of the essence of set theory, we have introduced cardinal numbers. Aleph 0 is the size of the set of natural numbers, the continuum is the size of the set of real numbers, and so on. Later, we studied ordinal numbers, the types of well-ordered sets. It wasn't until chapter 11 when we defined what an ordinal number formally mean. And now we finally reveal what is the formal meaning of cardinals. In the formal world of set theory, every object should correspond to a set. So which set should represent e.g. the cardinal number continuum? Continuum should represent all the sets of the same size as real numbers have, or the power set of omega. One idea could be to take all the sets of size continuum and pack them into a set, but we cannot do that. The axioms don't allow this and we would obtain a contradiction, for example by Russell's paradox. We have to do it another way, we choose a representative. But which one? Is the set of real numbers a good representative of this cardinality? Or the power set of omega? None of these choices is good enough to be used for an arbitrary cardinality. Ideally, we would like to have a method, if someone gives us a set, to produce a unique representative of the set. Although it may sound strange, mathematicians have decided to use ordinal numbers for cardinal numbers. By the well-ordering principle, which we have seen at the end of the previous chapter, we can rearrange the real line to something well-ordered. So there is an ordinal number of the cardinality continuum. The cardinality of a general set is represented by an ordinal of the cardinality. We just have to select one. Given a fixed cardinality, there are usually multiple ordinals. For example, the cardinality LF0 determines the size of omega that is here among all the ordinals, but also for example of omega times 3 that is here. In general, all the ordinals before omega 1 starting with omega are of cardinality LF0. With other cardinalities it is similar. When we look at all the ordinal numbers of continuum size, we find an interval in the class of all the ordinal numbers. We are drawing ordinals a bit like real line here, but it is not a real line, it is something well ordered. This means that our interval must contain its first element. And that's it. Formally a continuum is the least ordinal number of continuum size. And all the other cardinal numbers are defined the same way. So LF0 is formally identical to omega, LF1 to omega1 and so on. There is no formal difference between the symbol Aleph and Omega. Just that Aleph suggests that we are studying cardinalities, whereas with Omega we care more about the well orders. However, this view of cardinal numbers is not only useful for formalism. The ordinal numbers, which are the least of their cardinalities, turn out to be handy in transfinite recursion. Let's see this first on a countable example. In the first chapter, we have studied the question of how to color all the squares of an infinite grid so that all the rows are blue up to finitely many squares and all the columns are yellow up to finitely many squares. We have seen a simply explicit solution, but we can also obtain the result by a straightforward recursive process. All the columns should be almost yellow and all the rows should be almost blue. Consider the set of all these requirements. As with any set, the set of all the requirements can be well ordered. But now we want more. We rearrange them to a cardinal number, so in this case to natural numbers. Now we are going to satisfy the requirements one by one. This column should be yellow, so let's make it yellow. This row should be blue, so let's make it blue except for the single square which is already yellow. We color the next column yellow up to the single blue square, the next row blue up to the two yellow squares and we continue this way until we satisfy all the requirements. And it was important that we have ordered the requirements to a cardinal number. We could also apply the same coloring procedure transfinitely, but we couldn't satisfy all the requirements this way. Suddenly we cannot ensure every row to be blue just by coloring the empty squares since there are infinitely many already colored squares in it. And they have been colored because we have executed an infinite number of steps before. On the other hand, on a cardinal number as before, it is guaranteed that in every step we have done only a finite number of steps before, so coloring all the empty squares must satisfy the appropriate row. 
and similar ideas also apply to general cardinal numbers. When we are going through omega, the cardinal number aleph zero, we can take advantage of the fact that in every step we have passed less than omega steps. Similarly, when we go through the cardinal number continuum, in every step we have passed less than continuum steps. Let's see a specific application of this idea on an example problem. We want to construct a subset of the plane such that every circle passes through exactly three points of the subset. That is not so easy. Such a set must contain some points virtually anywhere as we can draw the circle arbitrarily small anywhere we wish. On the other hand, the set must be sparse enough so that also all the big circles pass through only three points. To construct such a set, we need to know one more lemma. In chapter 2, we have seen that LF0 times LF0 equals LF0. In the proof, we've considered a general pair RC and assigned 2 to the power of R times 2C plus 1 minus 1 to it. There is an obvious question of whether such theorem holds also for other cardinal numbers. It is not true for finite cardinals bigger than 1, 2 times 2 is not 2, but what about infinite cardinals? Say continuum. Continuum counts the sequences of zeros and ones. So we take two such sequences and we would like to encode them into a single sequence. This is trivial, we just zip the two sequences together. In fact, this lemma that the Cartesian product of a set with itself is of the same cardinality is true for all infinite sets. We are going to use it to know that if a set A is of a size less than continuum, also the set of pairs of A is less than continuum. And we don't have to stop at pairs. By using the lemma repetitively, we also get that the set of triples and so on is less than continuum. However, the proof of the lemma is a little bit technical, so let's postpone it to the end of this chapter and return to our problem. We want a set that intersects every circle at exactly three points. We construct it with a transfinite process such that in every step we satisfy one of the circles. How many circles do we have? Every circle is determined by its radius, a positive real, and its center. It is represented by two real coordinates. In total, a circle is determined by three real values, so their number is continuum times continuum times continuum, which as we know equals continuum. Let's arrange all the circles on the cardinal number continuum the least ordinal number of size continuum. Now we are going to satisfy these circles one by one. We take the first circle and arbitrarily place three points on it. With the second circle, we have to be more careful. We cannot place the point at the intersection with the first circle. If we did this, the first circle would already contain four points and we want just three points on each circle. Let's mark the intersections red, meaning that we are not allowed to place a point there we are allowed to place the fourth point anywhere except the intersections. Now it gets a little bit more complicated. Every triple of already established points defines a circle passing through the triple. These circles are already full. We are not allowed to put any more points on them. So they block further points from the blue circle which still needs two more points. Fortunately, there are only finitely many blocked points so we still have an infinite number of options for the second point. That creates further full circles and blocks further finite number of points on the blue circle, but we still have enough space for the third point. Again, new full circles emerge, but the second circle is done and we can continue. It can happen that during going through all the circles, we meet some circles that already contain some of our points, so there is less work to be done. Sometimes we meet circles that already contain three points, but they never contain more. This is because we are making sure that we never put a fourth point on a circle with three points. It is just necessary to assure that there is always some space outside of the forbidden points. With the second or third circle, we simply argue that there are only finitely many forbidden points, but this argument turns invalid since we satisfy infinitely many circles. We need a bit more sophisticated reasoning using cardinalities. We take advantage of the fact that we are going through a cardinal number. So in every step, there are less than continuum steps behind. In every step, we have added at most three points. So in every step, 
there are less than continuum edit points in total. Every full circle, including those we have filled intentionally, is determined by three points. Since there are less than continuum points so far, there are less than continuum triples of points. This is where we need the stronger variant of our lemma. Therefore, there are less than continuum full circles. In the current step, we want to add a point to a fixed circle. It is intersected by every full circle, at most at two points. There are less than continuum full circles, so there are less than continuum forbidden points. The entire circle consists of continuum points, so in every step we can find a point we can place on the circle. This way we have verified that we will not get stuck in processing the circles. The entire argument is based on the fact that we have ordered the circles on a cardinal number, so in every step there are less than continuum many steps behind. The transfinite recursion with choice will do its job, satisfy all the circles and outputs the required set. Impressive, don't you think? The transfinite recursion with choice and on a cardinal suddenly renders infinity pretty tame compared to how inaccessible it seemed at the beginning. At the end of not only this chapter, but also of the series, we proved the promised lemma that kappa times kappa equals kappa for every infinite cardinal number kappa. Kappa is a Greek letter often used for denoting cardinal numbers. We start with an alternative proof of why LF0 times LF0 equals LF0, which we then generalize to further cardinals. We have the Cartesian product LF0 times LF0 and we would like to enumerate its elements with natural numbers. We split the Cartesian product into gradually growing squares. When enumerating the elements, the exact order will not be as important as a rule that we are always taking elements from the least possible square. So we start in the square 1 times 1, then we collect the square 2 times 2 and we continue with further squares according to our rule. At every step we collect the least square containing some remaining elements. Every green square has a finite edge, so it has only finitely many elements inside. Therefore we cannot run out of natural numbers in any of the squares, so we enumerate the entire Cartesian product. Now it may seem that I am emphasizing an unimportant detail, but it works the same when multiplying LF1 times LF1. As before, we imagine squares in LF1 times LF1, and we are going to enumerate them with the elements of the cardinal number LF1, that is omega1. First, we collect the square omega times omega in omega steps. Next, we continue, say, with these omega plus 1 steps. Well, we cannot go left now as before, there is not the first element from the right, but it doesn't matter, there is a well order on the remaining elements, for example this one. This way we have finished the square number omega and we continue in the same way. There are no more tricks. Every partial square is of a countable edge, so it contains only countably many elements inside. Therefore we cannot run out of elements of omega 1 in any partial square and we enumerate the entire square with omega 1. And that is the general proof. We just have to realize two more things. First, cardinal numbers form a subclass of all the ordinal numbers. Consequentially, they are well ordered and we can prove that kappa times kappa equals kappa gradually with transfinite induction. So when we are proving it for a fixed kappa, we can assume that we have already proven it for all the previous cardinal numbers. And second, no infinite cardinal number has the last element. If it had, we could move the last element to the beginning, hide it into the first omega, so we would get a smaller ordinal number. Since a cardinal number should be the least ordinal number of its size, this cannot happen. Therefore, every point in kappa times kappa is contained in a partial square. Since kappa is a cardinal number, the length of the partial square's side is less than kappa. We have already proven the lemma about this size, so also the amount of points inside the partial square is less than kappa. Therefore, we cannot run out of the indexing cardinal kappa inside the partial square and kappa times kappa equals kappa. This finishes the proof of our lemma and of the existence of a set intersecting every circle exactly three times. What would I like for you to get from this series? From the first videos, that infinity is interesting and beautiful but also tricky and surprising compared to what we are used to from the finite world. From the following videos about the foundation of mathematics, 
that virtually all mathematics can be built from a few axioms and sets that are containing each other. And the final part should demonstrate that this theory is also capable of something, that although we have proven at the beginning of this series that there is an uncountable amount of real numbers, so we cannot go through them one by one, we have gone through them one by one in the last chapter and it was not such a big deal. And that is everything from this series. In the very end, I would like to thank my brother, Radek Olshak, for the piano intro and to Grant Sanderson, aka 3 blue one brown for an impressive animation tool. And of course, thank you for watching till the end, even when I was sometimes doing boring technical stuff or crazy incomprehensible stuff and... Have an infinite day!